um, that um, uh, quickly, this, this is incredibly important. Um, I was just uh, with George Michael. We were, she, we were working in London on the 23rd of December. And so George and I had already signed contracts to work on a new record together. So uh, we were working on a remix, Russell and I were just finished the files and I didn't want to, I didn't want to send it to him. I wanted it, him to hear it live. Then when he knew that Sheik was coming over to play live that day, he was like, okay, cool, it's great, let's, we'll figure it out. But he was also doing a movie for Showtime. So I went over to shoot the film and I was the last artist to shoot the film. Um, 24 minutes after I left his house, my cell phone just blew up. Oh my God, I'm so happy now, this is great. He had just gotten his driver. Oh, that's me leaving my house. He leaving his house. See, see my name, Niall, on the record? The way that the film works, and it's an amazing film, is that George uh, makes three songs for each artist, and he plays them, and we all critique them, and it just, it's actually brilliant, because you learn a lot about music, you learn a lot about the artistic process, how things go from an idea and turn into something really tangible and blah, blah, blah. But anyway, so he says, I'll call you tomorrow. And I said, no, 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 I can't talk to you tomorrow. It's the 24th and we're flying home. So I said, well, call me on Christmas Day. You know, 20, we're musicians. Fuck to us. Christmas and New Year's all the same to us. Um, so I said, call me on Christmas Day. Typically on Christmas, I go to the movies and try and catch up on all the films so that we can join the, <laughs> the, the, the Academy Award pools and stuff that everybody does. So I like, like see everything. So I'm sitting in the theater and my girlfriend looks at her cell phone and instead of getting a call from George, which is what we're expecting, we get an alert that says, George Michael found dead. And, uh, and I, was, I was devastated. Um, because it was just, th these type of things in my life um, have, I, I, I won't say they've plagued me, but it's been so crazy, you know I mean? Like the doctors thought I was gonna die six years later, I feel fabulous, I'm, I'm doing better than I've ever done. So now my mom is very, very ill, and, and when I started to write this musical, and believe me, it, it is so happy, it is so phantasmagorical, it's so much fun, it's so over the top. I have like the greatest producers in the world working with, with me, greatest team. I mean, this music is the shit. And also, you gotta know every song, man. Every song is a hit. <laughs> it's amazing, we've done some really clever stuff. But anyway, so George passed away, and I, and I hate to go into my girl's time, because she is a genius. I just love her, I was just in her dressing room. But anyway, um, um, but I gotta tell you this, I gotta wrap this up properly. So I was being stalked really hardcore. And um, why would I be stalked? I told you I'm not really that famous. But I was being stalked very heavily. Uh, the person who was stalking me uh, found out that I was building a house in Turks and Caicos. So he built a house in Turks and Caicos too. Um, this person, we would do shows and we'd look on the side of the stage and the person was there and it was like, well, wait a minute, you know, like, this is really weird, it was starting to get uncomfortable. Um, you'll understand, I'm gonna show you who our stalker was. <laughs> Prince. Prince would come to our shows and say, no. All I want to do, man, is just play Let's Dance with you. That's all I want to do, is play Let's Dance with you. But Prince, we have an entire show. You know, when we get to Let's Dance, we do anything. You know, I feel uncomfortable stuff. You know, you're Prince. You're like the biggest star in the world. I love you, man. We're great friends. You know, he's like, no, I want to do this. So then Prince figured out the way to get me to play Let's Dance with him. He says, I know. I'm going to hire Sheik. <laughs> so he books us to play the Essence Festival. And then he tells me that he wants to... Um, interview me. It's like the Diana Ross record. He wants to know what's in my mind. What makes Nile Rogers tick? So, this is the last night I ever saw Prince alive.
doesn't know this story. I know why he loves that song, I love it too. Let's Dance Change My Life. One night I was partying, I was hanging out with Billy Idol. And uh... <laughs> we walked into this club called The Continental, and we saw David Bowie sitting in the corner all by himself. This is exactly how it happened. Billy and I walked into the club and he went, Bloody hell, that's fucking David Bowie. And he said Bowie, because that's how they say it in England. He's David Bowie. He barfed. He went, Bloody hell, that's David fucking Bowie. And he wiped off his hand with his sleeve and went, Alright. So, what I didn't know about David until that night was he was a jazz fanatic, and I grew up in a bebop household. I grew up in modern jazz. Thelonious Monk was my mom's friend, and Nina Simone, and people like that, and Gloria Lynn, like all the hippest people in the village. So, Bowie and I, we thought, well, what, we, what do we want to do? What do we want this record to sound like? So, David said to me, like, you know, I want it to be a record full of hits. I was like, wow, really? David Bowie's last record was called Scary Monster. <laughs> that shit didn't have many hits on it. <laughs> okay, it sounded like an artistic project to me. Uh, David Bowie wants hits, pop songs. So I went over to Switzerland and I'm lying in bed, minding my own business. And David walks into my bedroom and goes, nah, that. I think this is a hit. And this is what he plays. <laughs> I'm gonna have to turn in my black union card. <laughs> it's, it's a, I, I said, but can I do an arrangement? And he said, sure, go ahead, man, knock yourself out. So I started, the, the moving voice thing wasn't really working for me. It, it was cool, but it didn't sound like all the stuff that we had thought we were gonna do. So I, I went. Yeah, man, I'm gonna hit you with an A minor 13. <laughs> and then, um, so he was, he was, he was feeling it, you know. He was like, and then I went. Many people know this, 17 days, start to finish. 
biggest album of David Bowie's life. That's us singing the pyramid. So I know I'm going to go about really terribly, terribly sorry. Um, but the, 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 the show, the inspiration for this show, you know, I tell this whole story through the eyes of myself as a ten and a half year old kid because the world when I was young was just so beautiful and so rosy and so magical and I wanted people to see the world the way I see it through my crazy rose colored spectacles and um, you know I um, I'm doing this project it's the biggest project of my life because of my mom um, my partners all of the different people that have helped me get to where I am today um, I just want to say, I want to get this right. Though this is the single biggest project I've ever embarked upon, I feel compelled to pay tribute to all the people who've helped me along the way, who are no longer here. The greatest irony is that after being sober for 22 years, the most <laughs> You all raise your hands and you better leave me drunk shit. I don't know. I thought this would make you walk out the door. Um, <laughs> after being sober for 22 years, the most important partner in my life uh, has now been dead for more than 20. Bernard and I got sheep back together, and now the band flourishes. We just played at the White House. A couple of weeks ago. Amazing. But to this very day, the most important show of my life is the last one that I played with Bernard Edwards. <laughs>